In this short video, we're going to look at spring mass systems which have a forcing function. So how does that impact our uh, differential equation or the equation of motion? Well, in the differential equation, we're going to have to include this external forcing function. And so if I write that in uh, standard form, and we're going to divide that original forcing function by the mass, and we'll call that new forcing function capital F. And again, to help us with the analysis, we may replace the coefficient here on the velocity by 2 lambda, and the coefficient on x with omega squared. So we'd like to interpret and solve this initial value problem. So let's look at this. What this tells us, the coefficient on the second derivative term, on the acceleration term, tells us that the mass of this spring mass system would be one-fifth slugs, or its weight would be 32 over 5 pounds. And is attached to a spring with a spring constant of k equals 2, that we, have got, we get from the coefficient on x. What else can we say? Well, the coefficient on the first derivative on the velocity is 1.2, so we're using viscous damping with a damping coefficient of 1.2. The right-hand side tells us something about the the external function. So it's being driven by a force with a period of 4 over 2 pi. 4 is the coefficient on t inside the cosine function. And that could simplify to 2 over pi. And the initial conditions tell us that the object is released from rest. That's where we see that the velocity, the initial velocity is 0. And it's at a point two, I mean, sorry, one half foot below the equilibrium position. Remember, in this system, down is positive. So if it's a positive one half, it means a positive one half below the equilibrium position. Uh, so even with, with damping, we have this external forcing function. So the object is going to remain in motion until the forcing function is turned off. So let's go ahead and uh, try to solve this. We'll write it in standard form. Take a look at our auxiliary equation. So we get complex conjugate roots. So we're going to expect to see oscillatory motion. And now we need a particular solution. This is a non-homogeneous equation. So we use undetermined coefficients. We'll assume that the particular solution is the sum of a sine and a cosine function. We just need to determine the coefficients. So we'll go ahead and take the first and second derivative of our assumed form of the particular solution and substitute that back into the differential equation and then compare the corresponding coefficients. That gives us a system of equations which we can solve to get these values for a and b. So now we know um, what the general solution looks like. The only thing that's left is to determine for our given initial conditions what should be the values of c1 and c2. And we just do that for at least the uh, first uh, condition. We just have to uh, do uh, some substitution. That gives us the value for c1. For the second initial condition, we need the derivative. So we'll go ahead and take the derivative. And here I've used the product rule uh, on the expression inside the brackets. But once I have the derivative, then I know that I can impose the condition that the initial velocity should be 0. And that gives me the value of c2. 
So now I've got my uh, general solution. And you'll notice that there is a term that's multiplied by a, uh, an exponential term with a negative exponent. So as t goes to infinity, that term becomes negligible. And that's what we call the transient term. And then the oscillatory part is our steady state. And so why don't we take a, a look at the graph of these terms. So right now, all we're looking at is the transient term. And you can see that um, remember this is just the transient term. But as a, even a, when t reaches by pi over 2, certainly by uh, 2 pi over 3, uh, the transient term is essentially zero. It's not making any contribution. Or the steady state is uh, a sine wave. And then if we combine those together and graph all three, so the green here is our actual equation of motion. And you can see that really, and with this scale, by the time you reach pi over two, the steady state is indistinguishable from the actual solution, meaning that the transient term uh, is uh, making essentially no contribution. All right, so we finished up our discussion of spring mass systems. Uh, I hope you found that useful. It's an extremely practical term or practical application for many use cases. <laughs>